presented by Amber Doctor and Philip Doctor. Amber Doctor is a front-end manager developing web-based real-time gamification applications developer in Python. Philip Doctor is a back-end technical lead at Data Stacks Building Ops Center in Conjure and Python for Cassandra. And with you right now, Philip Doctor. Thanks. Hi, I'm really excited to be here. Um, I was looking at you know DPI as a conference. Um, Amber and I were, and at some point in your you know, journey through data analytics, um, you might end up with an enormous amount of data, uh, you know, far more than it's going to fit in a, you know, a single machine. And at that point, you're going to look around and notice that there's an enormous number of uh, distributed database options available to you today. One of those options is Cassandra. And um, when you get started with Cassandra, oh, you know, sorry. Here's the slides. If you have a hard time reading the screen for some reason, you can just go to the, this, this website. And uh, you'll find the top three talks are all what you're going to hear today. So if you'd rather follow along locally, you'll get to like a, a website that looks like this. And I'm going to start with this intro to Cassandra, and then we'll, we'll work our way up. So uh, here we go. Um, sorry, taking a picture. Oh, and it, it did a really great job of not hiding the address bar. Whatever. OK. Uh, and so you know, you're going to look around, and there's going to be a ton of options out there. Um, and one of them is Cassandra. As a full disclosure, I work at DataStax, and we contribute a lot of code to Cassandra. Uh, so I am related to this project, but I think it's a great solution um, for a lot of your needs. And so uh, we'd like to just kind of take a look at an intro to it and how to get started with it if you choose this as your solution. So for, for starters, um, what is Cassandra? Well, Cassandra is a distributed database. So it was built from the ground up uh, to be running on a lot of machines rather than just be running as a single instance on one machine. Um, Cassandra is open source. It's written in primarily in Java. And uh, so all the open source goodness that comes along with that is available to you. You can go check out the code base. If you have questions about how things work exactly, you can read the code. If it doesn't work for your needs exactly, you can always modify the code. So all the open source goodness we have is part of Cassandra. Uh, Cassandra is built to have no single point of failure. We're going to talk a lot more about that. So some of the solutions out there, you'll see you know, an orchestrator or a master node or something like that, that if that goes down, you're in trouble. That's not really the case with Cassandra. Um, it's highly scalable. That's kind of a loaded word. Everyone means something different when they say that. What I mean by that is uh, as your, 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 the size of your data um, is going to continue to expand, you're going to be able to horizontally add more commodity hardware to accommodate um, larger and larger amounts of data. Um, and finally, one of the really cool things I think about Cassandra is there's this tunable consistency. And um, if you're familiar with the CAP theorem, I, this, this might make sense to you. But basically, a lot of databases create this trade-off for you where you might have um, the ability to say, I have, uh, I need my data on this distributed database to be perfectly consistent at all times uh, because the, the nature of this problem really demands it. Or you might say, hey, it's okay if some of my data is a little bit stale, but this system needs to always be up and, and being able to service customers or something like that. And uh, so many databases make you choose. Cassandra actually lets you tune that because the truth is that's usually actually a business problem. We think about it as an engineering problem. Uh, and that's mostly just because we get saddled with making things work. Uh, but actually, usually that's a business problem in your specific domain that you're working with is one that either uh, really demands that high availability or that very high consistency. And so with Cassandra, you can kind of meet both business needs. Um, OK, so Phil, you told me there's a ton of solutions out there. Why is Cassandra a really good solution? Um, well. First off, Cassandra has amazingly high availability. There's a Cassandra user out there. They had two different data centers. Uh, one was located on the East Coast. One was located in the Midwest. Uh, they had Hurricane Sandy come along and knocked out their East Coast. And from their customer's perspective, their Cassandra-based solutions continued right along, um, serving data the whole time, uh, even with a whole data center taken out. So. When you, when you think about highly available solutions and you know, like what kind of losses you can suffer, um, Cassandra has the ability to really give you a ton of, of, ton of uptime. Um, you might pick Cassandra when you need to store truly massive amounts of data. So we're talking about many terabytes and petabytes of data. If you have data sets like that, many databases are not going to be capable of actually storing them. Cassandra is capable of doing such a thing and has done so right now in practice. Um, it can handle a high volume of read and writes. High is a vague word. What do you mean, Phil? Well, uh, Google was showing off their cloud solution, and they said, 
uh, here's our cloud solution handling a million requests per second. And somebody snarked back and said, yeah, what database is going to keep up with that? So they stood up Cassandra in a follow-up blog post, and they showed Cassandra servicing a million writes per second. So when I, when I say a high volume of read writes, we have in-practice examples, and you can Google it, of a million writes per second. So that's a lot. Um, and finally, there's kind of two flavors you might think of with Cassandra. There's Apache Cassandra, which is that open source project I mentioned. There's also something called Datastax Enterprise. And Datastax Enterprise takes Apache Cassandra, and it builds a lot of integrations onto it for you, um, such as analytics like uh, Hadoop, if you want to be using Hadoop with Cassandra, that's built in. Uh, search via Solar. Um, there's also like a Spark plugin. So uh, if you want to have one single store of data and leave your data at rest rather than ETLing it between a bunch of different systems, you've got some really great options if you pick Cassandra and end up going with Datastax Enterprise. OK, uh, does anyone actually use this thing, Phil? Well, yeah, tons and tons of people. There's a, a website you can go to, see all the companies. I cherry picked a few just because I, I was in a mood to. No one paid me to. I just was like, dude, I like these companies. So uh, Netflix heavily uses Cassandra. They talk about it all the time. Microsoft, Cassandra user, CERN and NASA. They've got all those sensors you know, firing, taking millions of readings. Uh, they're using data, uh, I'm sorry, Cassandra. Uh, Instagram, Call of Duty. And one of the things you'll notice about these companies that I picked, because I, again, I just handpicked them out of this big list, is all these people, they're solving very different domains of problems. Um, and so, you know, if somebody's like, oh man, there's like this one pigeonholed great use case for Cassandra, but nothing else. That's really not the case. These, as you can see from these companies, they're solving very different problem domains, and all of them found a great use for Cassandra. So people are definitely using this thing. Okay, so enough with like the, the sales pitchy bit. You probably want to know how this thing actually works. Uh, so here I've got a depiction of a bunch of dots uh, arranged in a ring, okay? And this is, this is a, a depiction of a cluster. And um, the nodes are, are these dots. What is a node? A node is an instance of Cassandra running. Typically, an instance of Cassandra or a node is going to be its own machine to give Cassandra a lot of space to, to breathe and, and really take use of all the resources on that machine. Um, so and you'll, the other thing you'll notice is all these dots are the same color. There's not like one to the side that's red, right? Uh, we have here depicted a peer-to-peer -peer solution because this is a peer-to-peer -peer database. Um, OK, and then they're arranged in a ring. Uh, what's up with this ring? Well, when you go to store your data, what we're going to do is we're going to compute um, a token value for your key. And that token value is going to su fall somewhere between minus 2 to the 63rd and 2 to the 63rd. And depending on that value, that's going to determine which one of these nodes is going to handle your request uh, to, to store this data. So let's say you, know, you, you um, came up with uh, you know, your, your computed value is 5. That's going to fall like over here in the ring. And so this node is going to handle this segment of, of the workload because your, your value computed to 5. So that's how these nodes are going to work together to divide up uh, your data between them. There's also some cool stuff. I'm just I'm really pressed on time. Uh, you can actually uh, have a concept of, of racks and data centers. I talked a little bit about data centers before, but you can also define racks and say, hey, these two nodes are co-located on the same rack, and so if we were to have a total rack failure, I don't want all of my data living on the same physical rack. Um, and so that you can, you can make a lot of kind of really cool guarantees to make sure that your data is distributed between physical racks or between data centers or all the above. Um, I'm going to go with the simple depiction just because I don't have time to dig into that, but just be aware it's out there and it's super cool. OK, uh, here's my beautiful MS Paint skills. Uh, <laughs> imagine that that's more of a ring and less of a triangle. I just didn't know how to make a curved line. Um, and uh, so let's say we want to take a look at, at how this thing works when it's time to change our cluster. So uh, in this first bit, we've got um, a ring where, where these three nodes have divided up the, the space amongst them. Okay. And we need some more capacity. We want to add a node to this, this database. So what we're going to do is we're going to bring up another node, node 4, and we're going to tell it about a seed node. What is a seed node? Is it something special? I finally got you, Phil. No. Any node in the cluster can act as a seed node. And all you're doing is you're telling it when you bring it up of a node that you happen to know is alive. Or you can give it a couple nodes. They say, hey, these five nodes are all seed nodes. And what node it 4 is going to do when it comes online is it's going to find one of those seed nodes that's alive, and it's going to talk to it and say, hey, tell me about the ring. 
who's alive, you know, how many machines are in this ring, who's, who's dividing up the range in what fashion. And so node one is going to reply with the, with the current state of the topology. And, and that's about it. Node four is going to come up and say, okay, well, I'm going to take over handling this portion of the range. And, 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 and we've joined the cluster. We don't have, again, like an orchestrator or a coordinator or a special node that, that you know, was uh, in, needed to bring node four into the cluster. Um, we just needed a seed node, which is, again, anything um, or any node. And um, the other cool thing to note about this is when we're talking about, like, the topology liveliness, um, we're talking about this information being shared by a gossip protocol. And so these nodes are actually going to be gossiping amongst each other just to determine who else is on the ring the whole time. Again, there's not a central authority or like a big broadcast that's going out here uh, to talk about node state. Uh, so that's how you would change your cluster. OK, uh, reads and writes. Um, so the client in the bottom left-hand corner here, if you can see that, I hope you can, uh, that would be like your application. OK? And what, you're, what the client is going to do is it's going to pick any node to talk to. Uh, it doesn't matter to the client. And that node it talks to is going to then act as a coordinator for the rest of the transaction. So the client doesn't have to know about how all this data is being stored under the hood. It's just going to pick a node and, and talk to it and say, hey, dude, I need to do a read and write. Um, and again, because any node can be a coordinator, if it's talking to node 2 and node 2 goes down, hey, it's cool. It can just move on to node 3. No problem. Write replication. So when you're talking about um, wanting to have some of those characteristics of high availability, the way that you're going to achieve that is to have a replication factor, which is the number of copies of your data we're going to store in, in the cluster. Okay? Um, so here we've got uh, a depiction of RF equals 4. That means that with a four-node cluster, if you perform a write, we're going to store a copy of that data on every single node in the cluster. Uh, this would also mean that if one of these nodes was to go down, we would no longer be able to satisfy an RF4, and you wouldn't be able to continue your writes. Um, so there's a, this is where you start to get into trade-offs about you know, how many nodes do I have, how many copies of redundant data do I need to keep around, and this is getting into that business decision of availability for you. Um, you can uh, also control, if you're not writing to every node, obviously, you can actually get into a great deal of detail about where these different writes are being stored. And that's where I was talking to you earlier a little bit about racks and data centers. You could say, hey, don't just write to everything. You know, write to these three nodes because uh, they're on different um, racks, and so you don't have to worry about rack failure or something like that. So there's a lot of tunability there. Um, and then finally, when it's time to read, how does that work? Um, so you've got these tunable consistency levels in terms of a read. And the, the consistency level is the number of nodes that need to acknowledge a client re, uh, request. So let's say we wrote to all four with an RF4. Um, we could then, on a read, do a consistency level quorum. So we're just looking for a majority of nodes to agree on that read. And uh, so in that case, we only need to talk to three nodes to get, to get a read. Or um, you know, maybe your profile is like, you know, uh, metrics and it's really okay if uh, things aren't totally consistent. You could maybe just do a CL1. So like the first node to reply, you're just going to go with that data. Uh, so that's, that's the tunable read consistency level. Cool. That's like the super high level. Um, this is Cassandra architecture. This is how reads and writes work. And it gives you enough knowledge to decide either this is right for me or not. And from that point, if it is right for you, the next thing you might want to know is like, how do I actually get rolling with this thing? Um, because like Phil, there's a lot of documentation online and I just want to try it and see something work. Um, so for this, I'm going to be talking about a tool called CCM, which is Cassandra Cluster Manager. You can totally just go to the website and download the um, Cassandra tarball and make it run. But a lot of the interesting things we talked about is when we're running more than one instance. And so then you're like, oh, God, Phil, do I need to you know, set up like you know, 50 virtual machines with different nodes running in order to like, actually experience the joy of a cluster on my laptop? This is a horrible development experience. The answer is no. There's a great tool called CCM. And what CCM is going to do is it's going to go and download Cassandra for you. And then it's going to create a tiny little cluster on your machine. Okay? And the GitHub page is right there. I've linked it. Um, it looks like this. It's written in Python. So if you're in a mood to, to read Python, you can go over here. There's some requirements for you to install. Um, but more or less, that's and some special instructions for OSX. Um, but more or less, it's, once you've got it going, it's fairly easy. I'm just going to say, hey, CCM, create a cluster. Name it um, Cassandra Dev Cluster. 
This minus three is it's going to have three nodes in it, so a cluster of three. And uh, this is the Cassandra version. This is cool too if you're just doing some dev work and you want to try out a new version of Cassandra. Dude, you just tell CCM a new version. It'll go download things for you. I mentioned earlier that there's another offering, DataStax Enterprise. If you want to use that instead of Apache Cassandra, CCM will handle that too. It just requires this uh, username and password. And uh, again, you can get one for free on the DataStax Enterprise website, but you do need that to go, to go download and use it for CCM. Um, so let me go ahead and do this for you, if I can highlight. And Okay, so here I've got um, a virtual machine, and I cloned CCM, and that's about it. Uh, oh, I did one more thing, which is when I, when I run this guy, uh, normally you'd see a download statement there, but I downloaded it ahead of time because I wasn't sure if I'd have internet connection. Um, so anyways, it, it noticed that I already downloaded it, and it just created a new cluster called Cassandra Dev Cluster. Um, and then the next thing I'm going to do there is I'm going to do the CCM start. So let's, the first part downloaded them and set them up. The next one is going to actually start a bunch of instances of Cassandra running. Uh, so this will take just a second to get rolling. Um, <clears throat> tech live demos are always painful. Actually, let me pull this up just a little bit in case you're in the back and having a hard time reading the bottom. Okay, so it started. We're all happy. Uh, and now you actually want to do something with Cassandra, right? That was the whole point. Um, so there's something called CQL. CQL looks a lot like SQL, um, but it stands for Cassandra Query Language. Um, and there's a shell, just like you would use for an, an SQL shell to execute commands. So let's go take a look at CQL SH. Uh, first, we can do CCM status. And here we see there's my cluster, Cassandra Dev Cluster, and it's got three nodes. They're all up. And then let's go CCM uh, node 1 CQL SH. That says I'm going to uh, use this CQL shell connected to node number 1. OK, and there's, there's the prompt. Um, OK, the next concept is there's something called a key space. Um, the key space is, doesn't really have a clear analog in the, the relational world. But basically, we're going to be putting all of our tables into this key space. So it's kind of like a, a container for all your, your tables. And um, at the key space level is how we manage those things like the replication factor that we were talking about before. And so any table that you put inside this key space is going to have that same profile of replication that we were talking about. So um, here you'll see I'm going to use um, a, create a new key space um, named intro. And with the following replication, class simple strategy, what does that mean? Um, it means that we're going to store some data on the node that we, we, the, that's primarily responsible for the data and then adjacent nodes um, for replicas. This is, again, where if you had like multiple data centers or racks, you would use a different strategy here for picking where replicas are stored. And I'm going to say um, replication factor of three. And so uh, if you think about it, I've got three nodes um, in this cluster. So when I, when I do a write, uh, that data should be stored on all of the different nodes in my cluster. So let's, let's go ahead and try that. Uh, comes back. We use intro. So now everything I do from now on is going to be inside that key space. Cool. And now I want to create a table. Tables hold your data. They're very much like um, what you think about in a relational world. Um, you need to, the important thing is with many NoSQL solutions, um, you need to choose a primary key that fits your data usage patterns. Uh, you can't do like cheap um, filters and joins like you can in, in relational, so you, you need to think um, pretty carefully about how you're going to be accessing data. Um, tables also let you specify other options like encryption or compression for the table. There's tons of things out there you can do with a table. Um, and, and ways to optimize your data. I'm going to use a very simple thing. I'm going to say I'm going to create a table named test data. There's a, an integer, which is going to act as the primary key. And I'm going to store like some text with it. That's cool. So this is a, a fairly simple tata, table. Take a look at that. This, is, this, this demo will get slightly more interesting, I, I promise, when Amber gets up here. But you're stuck with boring command line until, uh, until then. Um, and OK, cool. So we made, a, we made a table, Phil. Let's put some data in this thing. Again, this looks very much like SQL. We insert into test data. Uh, we're going to insert the key, data ID, and the data item. Uh, let's go ahead and do that. And then we can select uh, from test data where data ID equals 1. 
and there we go. We, we pulled back our data. I don't know, this is like kind of boring, but like, hey, it worked. Like this was like pretty quick out of the box. You got going, right? Maybe. Um, so that's, that's kind of how you can get started. Um, the last thing I wanted to show as part of this, this demo is when I was telling, telling you about replication, um, there's a really cool demo for people with money that I don't have where they, they uh, have like a bunch of uh, Raspberry Pi units and each Pi is running a different node and they just like yank the power cord dramatically out of a Pi and show you that like the Cassandra cluster still runs. I don't, I don't have money for a bunch of Raspberry Pis. So instead we're gonna do it with CCM. Um, and what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna tell CCM uh, to stop, um, actually, I'm gonna tell CCM to stop node one and to stop node two. And so if you remember, I made three nodes in this cluster, so we're still gonna have node three running at the end of this. Okay, uh, and CCM node three, uh, CQLSH. Let's connect to that guy. Uh, let's use intro, and let's select star from, what was my thing again? Test data, uh, where data, Test, what was it, data ID, test ID? Where data ID equals one, let's do that. And you can see it was still able to pull back the data. So like this is like my poor man's version of like, hey, we suffered catastrophic network loss and I was still able to, to select data, which is really cool, I think. Uh, and so that's how you can, you can kind of start getting going with this um, uh, in a, in a Dev environment, Amber now is going to show you how it's time to hook up Python to this and uh, and interact with Cassandra with Python. Okay, let me just pull up my slides. So I'm going to go through how you actually use Cassandra with Python today. I figured you guys have been seeing how it is and how great it is, and now since this is a Python conference, let's see how to use it with Python. So my slides are also, you can follow along with them. They're on slides.com. And I've picked Tornado to go with Cassandra today because, not because of the asynchronous things or how awesome it can be or how quick it can be to stand up, but because it's easy to highlight the Python-Cassandra interactions in this framework without you needing to know a lot about the framework in order to understand how you could sample it to use in your own frameworks. Yeah. Working on it. Is that better? Okay. And hopefully that thing will disappear. Okay. Um, so setting up Tornado. So if you haven't set up Tornado before and you want to play around with this demo on your own, I gave you a quick little run through of what I did on my Mac. Now, I always recommend um, when you're doing slides and talk, show what you did yourself, but then refer everyone to the documentation to figure out what they need to do. So this is just a quick overview. I made a project folder. I installed virtual env. Um, I created a virtual environment, and then I activated it. Then I installed Tornado with pip install. Um, and in order to check to see if things were working, I did hello world. And so this is an example taken for t from tornadoweb.org, um, which is where all the Tornado docs are. And I basically, I altered it so that you could say and run it from the command line with under under name equals under under main. And say, instead of saying hello world, it now says hello dpi2015. So to give you a quick idea of what it, the application in Tornado is actually doing, you're going to call that main function, it's going to make an app, it's going to start listening on port 8089, and then it's gonna open up the I loop and start listening. Um, the app is going to set up some routing, and then that default routing is going to have the handler, hello handler, with a basic git of printing some text to the page. And so you guys can see what that looks like. Hello dpi. So, tornado's up and running, let's get Cassandra going. So to get Cassandra going, we are going to do basically what he did. We're going to set it up. We're going to do some pip installs. We're going to clone CCM. The key thing here that isn't in the CCM documents is that we're going to install the Cassandra driver for Python. And that's just another pip install while we're in our virtual environment. 
So starting your Cassandra server, he said there was a little extra you have to do with OSX. I've included that little bit of extra here. So we're going to create our cluster, and then we're going to start our cluster using CCM start. And I've already done this in the background because this is a demo, a live demo, and they always go wrong. So that's already set up and working. Now, the next thing we would do in order to set this up is we're actually going to create the database. For our application today, we're going to be doing a to-do list. It's an incredibly contrived example. Um, I'm sorry, I wanted to keep it very simple so that we could show the interactions. So it's going to have, um, we're going to make our key space. We're going to call it Tornado App. We're going to set a replication factor we're using the simple strategy. Remember, that's the one where it talks to the adjacent nodes when it's doing a replication factor up to two. And then we're going to use that, and we're going to create the database. And our to-do list table, or excuse me, not database, create the table. Our to-do list table is going to include a username with a text field, an ID with a UUID, uh, a to-do list with a text field, and the is complete is going to be a Boolean. And then we have our primary key. And our primary key, if you notice, is actually a composite key. It's going to include both the username and the ID in order to indicate what is actually going to be unique for that particular app, uh, entry. So the other thing you'll notice is in the primary key, username has an extra set of parentheses around it. Now, that's important to note because that's saying that the partition key is only going to be username. So the composite key can includes both the username and the ID, but the partition key, which is where you live on the cluster, or excuse me, on the nodes in the cluster, is only going to be the username. That means that when you want to pull all of the to-do list items for one single user, they're going to be in the same place, and you're not going to be bouncing around from cluster to cluster, around inside the cluster, excuse me, from node to node inside the cluster. So in order to connect your application, so that simple hello world, we're going to add in from Cassandra cluster, import cluster, and then we're going to say Cassandra cluster equals cluster, parentheses. Um, that's going to call the cluster function, and we're not passing it any arguments, so it's going to connect to localhost. So then we create a session, and we're going to say session equals Cassandra cluster dot connect, and we're actually going to pass in the Tornado app, um, at our key space, as a variable so that we don't have to use it in every single one of our queries. If you notice the code block on the bottom, we're actually going to be showing two different examples. You see right here, and this is the, the important part, is from to-do list versus from tornado app dot to-do list. So, and by not putting in tornado app, you'd have to use tornado app here every single time. So, simple get. We looked at the simple get before. It just printed hello world. In this particular case, we're actually going to say right here, it's self.render to do list.html. So we're going to render a template. And it's going to pass in username, which, like I said, it's a very contrived example. We're hard coding our username. I didn't want to make an authentication and have that cloud the actual interactions with uh, Python and Cassandra today. And then the last thing we're passing in right here is to do list rows. And so if you look up here, we've defined to-do list rows equals to session.execute. That is how you're actually connecting to the database. Um, and what we're going to hand it is some of that CQL that we were talking about before. Select ID to do and is complete from to-do list where username equals percent %s. And then you see that there is a tuple following that. That is the proper way to format a string. You don't want to concatenate your variables using plus signs here. Um, so we have also pointing out, since there's only 1% s, that means in Python, there's only one item in the tuple. You need to make sure you're putting this extra little comma here, or it won't read it as a tuple, and it won't work. So let's see what the template looks like. And this is the template that's going to be rendering the website. And if you look at it, and this is just some basics about Py uh, the Tornado Python um, framework, there's double curly bracers that's going to be rendering that username we passed in. And then here, we're going to use curly bracers and a percent sign. And that actually tells us um, that we're starting a Python block. And we're going to actually be opening up and writing some Python in our template, and there's no restrictions on it. That allows you to do for loops and if statements and other useful things in your template. So here we're going to go for item into do list. 
We're going to put a checkbox. We're going to have the label for the item. We're going to have a delete button. And we're going to have just down here is a little form method. And that's going to be posting new items. So let's take a look at that in the browser. And in case the browser doesn't work, we can see it here in just a sec. Um, I wasn't sure if I was going to have internet for this example. Oh, and it worked, but apparently on this particular screen, it's rendering differently. Um, sorry, my delete buttons are overlapping. Um, we've got the check buttons, we've got the labels, we've got the delete buttons, and we've got this add section. So let's talk about doing a post. Since we've already talked about get, let's talk about posts. So type in a word, hit add, we have a new item. And what that's doing is that's going back to our example here. And we're using that form submit method equals post. We're, and I wish this code had been just a little bit bigger. Let me see if I can, there we go. Um, we're defining a post method and it's going to hit that. It's going to say the new to do item is equal to self.get argument new to do. That's how Tornado pulls in the arguments from the post. Um, and then we're going to do another session.execute. And this time we're going to do an insert into. So insert into to do list, username, ID, to do, and is complete, giving values percent s, percent s, percent s, and percent s. Now I really want to point out the fact that I said percent s four times because I'm not using four strings. If you remember, UUID is a UUID, and uh, false is actually a Boolean. And if I had had an integer, we would have used normally in Python like percent %d. But in this case, it, because we're doing a query into the Cassandra language, you want to use percent %s for all of them so that you're actually inserting them as strings. Um, and then we're going to do self.redirect. And so that's the tornado way of redirecting to a different URL. We're actually redirecting back to our get with that particular one. And so that's going to, like I said, add a new item. So next thing we're going to look at is we're going to look at a put. That's updating an item. So we're going to, every time we click this checkbox, we've got a listener that's going to kick back some stuff to the back end. And we're actually going to update our database. So what does that look like? We have Ajax call listening on a checkbox. We're going to make that Ajax call be a put, uh, yeah, excuse me, put. And then we're going to pass it in the ID and completed status. So in the back end, and I'm going to pull this out just a little bit more so you can see. OK, it's not pulling out the right one. Um, I'll just scroll down just a little. We're grabbing that UUID again. We're saying is complete equals true if self.argument is uh, equal to Unicode true. And that's because you can't just straight cast to a Boolean. The Boolean is going to check whether there's contents and then return true. So it always return true. So we need to actually check it that it's Unicode. That's why we're doing the type, uh, the cast here for UUID2 is because it was in Unicode and we need it to be in a UUID. Um, then we're going to do a session execute again. That's us connecting to the Cassandra database. And we're going to say update to do list set is complete equals percent %s where ID equals percent %s and username equals percent %s. And again, passing in that tuple. This time we're going to do a self.finish. And self.finish is what's closing the connection. The last two times when we did self.render and uh, self.redirect, we didn't do it because both of them were entering and ending in the self.render, which the last line of that is actually self.finish. So it actually closes the connection on its own. Uh, and then the last thing I want to show you guys is delete. And so if we click this button, it's actually going to delete these test items. And we have same Ajax code. This time, instead of a type of put, we're using a type of delete. Uh, we're going to pass in the to-do ID. And then we're going to reload the function at the end so it'll get it and update, make the updates and show the updates. So the self-delete function is going to look just like the other ones. We're going to grab that variable to do ID. We're going to execute again, connecting to the Cassandra database. We're going to say delete from to-do list, where ID equals percent %s and username equals percent %s. And then hand it that tuple and then call self.finish. And so there's one last thing I want to tell you about um, deletes, is that you may not actually want to delete things. A lot of times when you're using Cassandra, your use cases are 
collecting large amounts of data. You, you aren't trying to you know, minimize the amount of data by deleting and removing extra stuff. So you might instead want to use an is deleted flag. And you can manage your is deleted flag the same way you would manage that is completed flag I was talking about. Um, and what that helps you do is keep accurate historical records. So instead of deleting something, you're just basically archiving it. Um, at this point, if we can get that second mic, I'm going to open the floor to questions. Can I get the second mic? The one you were passing around, you were using? Second mic. The mic. Yes. That one. Second mic. Nope, mic. He needs it. Yeah, now, <laughs> now does anybody have questions? Oh, no, the mic was for him to answer, but that'll work too. <laughs> oh. No, no, no. If you don't ask, ask your question, then I'm just going to have to repeat it. So go ahead. Add, add. So <laughs> how does Cassandra uh, handle concurrent writes to different nodes and sync them up? Uh, so the, right. Uh, how does it handle concurrent no writes to different nodes? So, um, so you're, the scenario that you're stating is, um, I'll just pull this up. So if I can get this thing to go. OK. Uh, so we, we've got a, a ring of four nodes. And you're saying we're going to have two different writes to the same partition key. Um, and, and which one is, is going to win out. Yeah. OK. So the, the easiest um, solution to this is, is going to be to, if you have a problem that looks like that, is to change how you're modeling your data so that you don't um, overwrite the same, so so there's ways that you can look at locking in transactions, um, that's available to you. But it's a tool that you, you probably don't want to reach for unless you absolutely have to. Okay, and so let's take a, a simple example of something that people want really high consistency of, like a bank account. Okay, um, obviously it's really bad if your bank account has the wrong data in it. And so what you might want to look at instead of carrying a running total that concurrent people might be trying to update the running total at the same time, you could um, catalog withdrawals and 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 um, deposits, right? And that way, when because you know, like when you write a check, there's a check number on there and stuff, right? Or when you swipe your your, your credit card, there's a there's an ID to the, that transaction. It, if you if that happens twice in a row, you're not trying to update the same row concurrently two different times. You you've got two different transactions, and then you can reconcile at the end of the day, which is by the way like what a lot of banks do anyway. There there'll be some sort of reconcile period, where where people will account for all that and find out if you're overdrawn and at what point and things like that. Um, so so you there are tools where you can you can do something like a transaction, um, but in general you want to try and solve that kind of a problem with a with a data modeling uh, issue instead. Yeah. Uh, is that only for development? How how would you connect to it yeah. without that? Yeah, okay, great. So the question was, um, I showed CCM. How would you connect to it without CCM? Um, so yeah, CCM is really just a development tool. Again, if you're running a bunch of nodes on a single, on a laptop in this case, or a single machine, and that's not what you want to do in production, you want to give Cassandra room to breathe and use all those resources to be fast. Um, and so in what you would do is you would, you know, use, I mean, <laughs> What you would do is you would take the provisioning tool of your choice. Um, I don't know, like Salt or um, uh, Chef, or you can use uh, Op Center, which is another uh, tool for Cassandra. And you can you can tell it to to install on this node, and it's going to do like a package install or a tarball install or whatever you decided to configure your. So it's almost like an ops question. That that's kind that ball is kind of like in your park of how you're going to to choose to install Cassandra. Uh, CCM, the way that it does is it just does a tarball install in like a little home directory for you so it doesn't conflict with everything else on your system. Um, past that point, how you would connect is, is exactly like, uh, so I said CCM node 1, CQLSH. What you do is you'd go to you'd either SSH to that node and type CQLSH, or you can give CQLSH an endpoint. You can say CQLSH to this host ID. So it, 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 and then from there, it's all the same. The same insert selects, you know, all the, the CQL is going to look the same. So it's really just a matter of um, how you want to manage your environment, and, but connecting to it, and once you're connected, it's going to look uh, vert, I, identical. Did that answer your question? OK. There's a, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, 
you said you mentioned that if there's a failure with the client, is the client responsible for connecting to a different uh, host, or does the first time you connect, the the client receives a list of other nodes that it knows that try to automatically connect. Yeah, okay, to. this is an awesome question. So the question is, if the client connects to node two, and I was like, node two can go down, and it's cool, you can just move on to node three because all the nodes are the same. Um, who's like responsible for that retry? Um, and the answer is, it's going to depend on what driver you're using. So uh, Amber demoed the Python driver. The Python driver is super smart um, because it was like made by people who make Cassandra, so they like. I like knew all the ins and outs of it. And what, what it does uh, is when you connect to it, you're, it the client, it kind of gets more like a list of like seed nodes, kind of like the, when you add a new node to the ring. And so really, it's going to iterate through that list of hosts until one of them is available. And it's going to connect to it. And then, and again, I'm just talking about the Datastax Python driver, not other things. But uh, when it connects to it, it's going to get back a list of the, rest, the, uh, uh, of the rest of the topology of the ring. So then it, it can move on underneath the hood without you noticing to a different to a different node. Now, there's even something cooler than that. I don't want to jawbone too much about this, but it's really cool. If you give the driver enough information about your schema and about the queries you're running, the, the driver can do the same kind of calculation. So if we connect to node two, uh, I should use a mouse rather than just running in front of the screen. I like to run in front of screens. It's a problem. Um, it, if we're, uh, let's say we're, we've got like RF of two, okay, and um, that means that like your data was stored on just node three and node four, but you connected to node two. Node two does some math to find out that your data is on, on node three and node four, and like the TLDR is like murmur three partitioner, but that's like a Google it on your own for fun. Um, okay, well, it turns out the client could do that too if you give it enough information. And so the client can actually be really smart and say, hey, dude, I know a lot about your query you're trying to run. How about I just go straight to node three because that's where your data is, and then we don't have to involve another coordinator. Um, but again, that, that's kind of like a fallback. If like that fails or something, we just go into normal coordination land, like normal, where you know node three would then just coordinate and get you to the right node, and it would be transparent to you. Cool. Other questions? Yeah. Are there cloud services that will provide Cassandra clusters? The question is, are there cloud services that will provide Cassandra clusters? The answer is yes, but like I don't offhand. Um, this is a, a answer I probably should know the answer to, and I just like offhand don't. Um, I know that there is in the a current. Um, you know what? I have been told to not tell things that I I know are coming in the future. <laughs> so the answer is right now. I know the answer is yes. I can't tell you offhand, and in the future, even more. Um, but don't quote me on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm on, this is being recorded for posterity. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, in the case of high consistency, if I add a new node to the cluster, will it talk to the other nodes to get a copy of the data? Oh, oh man, that's an awesome question. Uh, and this is like starting to get n near where we're running out of time on this, too, because uh, I want to talk about these things for hours. I just can't. Um, there's lunch. Right, there's lunch. You can bug me at lunch. <laughs> Okay, so when a new node comes on line, I depicted how it learns about the rest of the topology, and I, and I showed you how it's going to take over part of the ring, okay? But how does data actually get there is, is the question. So when the node connects, there's a bootstrap. There, you can tell it to do this bootstrapping process. It's optional. And when it does this bootstrapping process, it's going to go around and get a bunch of the data that it's responsible for and, and put it on itself, okay? There's more, though. Because life, life in distributed land is complicated, um, and and you know some people use Cassandra just because it's super cool, but it doesn't fit their their problems. And you know you you take on an extra complexity when you're dealing with a distributed database. So through the process, if you're looking at like a really big cluster, let's say you've got a hundred nodes, right? Like the chances of one being down like all the time or like constantly failing, like just it happens. We're talking about you know commodity hardware or in the cloud. Failure is to be expected, okay? And so there's two things that are going to help you out when failure happens in terms of getting your data back to the right place where a node d doesn't have the data because it's down or something. The first is called a hinted handoff. So let's say we were trying to store data. Let's say node 1 is the coordinator, okay? And uh, node 1 has uh, RF2, and, and, and one of the, the nodes it was supposed to write to is node 4. Okay, let's say it was supposed to write to node 3 and node 4. Okay, node 4 is down. What node one is going to do is it's instead going to store your data on node three, where it was supposed to be, and node one, where it's not supposed to be. Okay? But it's still satisfied to your RF of two. Okay? Now here, but there's more. It stored it with something called a hinted handoff. That's configurable. Okay? And what that means is if node four comes back online within that hinted handoff window, 
it's going to ship the data over to node 4 to bring it back up to state, okay? Now, the, and this is like the, the even t more TLDR version. The, you may find yourself in a situation where you exceeded that handoff window or like there's a lot of network problems, whatever, and just your data isn't perfectly consistent like it should be. There's a service you can run called Repair Service. It was, it was originally supposed to be called Anti-Entropy anti Service, but like uh, marketing got a hold of it. And now, it, now it's a repair service. Even though nothing's broken, it's, it's a repair service. And what it, what it does is it's going to go around your ring and make sure that all the data is in the right place on every node. And so sometimes it's necessary to run a repair just to make sure that everything is in sync. But again, if you're really worried about uh, highly consistent data on like that specific node at one point in time, you can always crank up that consistency level and make sure that it's either going to work right or it's going to give you a failed read, right? Because, uh, like, let's say we had we had that RF two and uh, for for our replication for node three and four, four is down. We still satisfied it with node one, but node one isn't supposed to have that data. If you do um, a, a read all, so all nodes that are stored the data have to reply, it's going to fail because the node that was supposed to have it, node four, can't reply. Okay, so you'd have to turn down the read consistency level to be one, where it can just talk to node three because node three was supposed to have the data. It has the data. There is a lot of like beautiful, well-illustrated graphs on the DataStax website. There's actually this, to, to answer your question better than my words can, there's this, this great thing, um, DataStax Academy, I meant to mention it and I didn't. Um, they have videos, they have coursework, they have homework assignment, they have example um, projects. Everything that you would want, if like you, you're, you've decided that this is a good solution for you, you can go through like their CERT program, it's all free, it's all on the website, it's super cool. Uh, like maybe one more question? Yeah. So when you instantiated your session variable within the Python code, you didn't have to specify the local host or the port. No. Um, you can. Sure, sure, sure. So it, it connects to like this, your local cluster. Yes. Um, and it then communicates to one of the nodes. Yes. And then, like, how does it know? Is there? You, and you mentioned it doesn't matter which node it communicates to. Like, how does it specify which node it communicates to? Or is that just the client automatically handling? The it? client is automatically handing it. And that's part of the Python drivers he was talking about earlier, um, being awesome and just doing it for you. There's all kinds of configuration variables I didn't get into that you can do very specific setups and you can ask it to connect very directly to certain ones. But for this simple example, I was trying to keep it very. Um, the minimal that you'd have to do just to get it up and start playing with it. Yeah, yeah, just everything Amber said is right, just to build on that. Cassandra really has a million performance tuning knobs because many of the people who choose to use Cassandra have a very strict performance um, metric that they're trying to hit. And so there are a lot of different options out there for like, you know, are you gonna round robin on the ring? Or like, you know, sometimes maybe if you've got, this is maybe less uh, relevant in Python than something like Java, but you know, you might have one, uh, Java driver with a thread pool of like, you know, 30 guys that are trying to do writes to it. And so, you know, how is it going to, you know, move that around the ring and load down which nodes? And th the answer is all of them are configurable. But the out of the box defaults of not specifying it mm -hmm. are more than enough to get you started into the point where like, you know, you can realistically be getting ready for, for prod. Um, and then at that point, if you do some sort of load stress testing or, or, or performance testing, then, and you find that you need something smarter, then you can start trying to twist those knobs. And I'm getting the signal that we're totally out of time. Uh, <laughs> so anyways, if you've got more questions, um, we're here for lunch. Feel yeah. free to talk to us. Super happy to talk to you. Thanks. Thank you, everybody.